Hello, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Left Brain Professionals. I'm Steve Bressler, and I'll be your moderator today. If you need any help at any time, you can email us at support at leftbrainpro.com or use the Q&A function within the Zoho platform. Let's go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is hosted on the Zoho platform. You should see a small toolbar with five icons in the bottom middle of your browser window. The first button opens the Q&A panel. The second button opens the poll panel. The third button allows you to interact with us. The fourth button opens the additional settings, and the fifth button will allow you to end or leave the webinar. By selecting additional settings, you can access the audio and video settings, network performance, preferences, and other items. Um, if you have any connection or audio issues, please try, please try the following solutions. Turn, your, turn off your VPN. Um, exit and re-enter the event, try potentially using a different browser, or connect from your personal PC, phone, or tablet. You can download the Zoho webinar from your app store or run a speed test using speedtest.net. Please enter your content questions in the Q&A panel at any time during the presentations and we'll address as many questions as we can. In order to receive credit for today's presentation, you must respond to three of the four polling questions. Certificates are generated automatically and will be emailed within 48 hours after completion of the webinar. A short six question survey will display in your browser at the end of today's webinar. Please take a few moments to answer the questions and provide any feedback. The recording of today's presentation will be available on our YouTube channel and the link will be included in the follow-up email. So thank you for your attention and without further delay, I'll turn it over to Robert for today's content. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us to talk about payroll today. <clears throat> And my name is Robert Jones. I'm your presenter. Um, the title for today's webinar is Unlocking Payroll Efficiency. Just a little brief about who we are at Left Brain Professionals. We're a boutique accounting firm that works only with U.S. federal government contractors. We live, eat, and breathe the FAR, DFARS, and cost accounting standards on a daily basis. Deal with all things DCAA, such as indirect rates, incurred cost proposals, accounting systems, and audits. If you interact uh, with our team, in addition to Steve and I on today's webinar, uh, you'll also meet Suzanne Camden along the way. And our learning objectives for today, at the end of our roughly one hour together, you should be able to describe labor distribution, explain the basic payroll journal entry, identify services provided by payroll companies, and list some of the common issues with payroll. With that, we'll kick off with our first polling question. So for our first poll question, who processes your payroll? A, you process it in-house. B, we use one of the payroll companies C, our external accountant or tax CPA does it. Or D, you're not sure. We'll give you a few moments here to get your responses in, and then uh, Robert will take a look at the results. All right, looks like most people have voted, so we're going to go ahead and close the poll and uh, share those results uh, again there's with this one there's no right or wrong answer um it's interesting that we do have about 25 percent of people saying that they process it in-house and uh, a little mixture of other people either using one of the big payroll companies or that your uh, tax cpa or some other external accountant uh, provides that for you 
All right. Uh, back to our slides and our content here. So payroll processing, um, it, payroll is an, one of those interesting topics uh, in the accounting world, uh, one of those interesting functions. Uh, I know a lot of people get caught up in it and think that it's difficult and certainly it can be difficult and confusing at times. Um, but quite honestly, payroll is and can be very easy uh, especially if you have the proper configuration um, and uh, if you're following some of the best practices that we'll talk about uh, throughout today's webinar. <clears throat> it's interesting that we do have some people who said that they are processing payroll in-house. We don't see much of that anymore. Most people do use um, some other provider. Uh, and in fact, if your external accountant or tax CPA is preparing your payroll, uh odds are very very high that they're not actually processing the payroll themselves that they too are using one of the big uh payroll providers um, out there a little bit of background information on payroll um especially as you're looking to set up payroll and uh, one of the things that i like to remind people here <clears throat> excuse me especially as uh, we live and work in a multi-state environment uh, in this remote, more remote world. Uh, we're hiring employees across state lines, and quite often uh, we may be hiring an employee in a state in which we do not currently have any other employees. And so one of the things that you need to remember is that it is your responsibility um, as the employer to do those registrations. Uh, each state does require you to set up uh, multiple accounts, and some of those do vary by state. Uh, for example, here in California, where I live, um, as well as uh, some of the uh, you know, Washington state, and it was a, one that we came across the other day uh, working with a client. Not only do you have to set up basic uh, uh, income tax withholding, and unemployment right those are the two common ones some states actually have other registrations and other taxes or fees that you have to pay uh, for example and again in both california and washington that in addition to regular suda or state unemployment tax that is the employer's responsibility uh, there are also some additional employee uh, taxes beyond just the um, income tax. Uh, and, and again, in many of these states, each of those payroll taxes is a separate registration. Um, and you need to make sure that you have set up all of those, that you have the um, uh, registration numbers and the appropriate rates, because you need to provide that information to your payroll company so that it is set up correctly. <clears throat> now, one of the things to keep in mind with this, um, I am currently unaware of any payroll companies or accountants who will do these registrations for you um, again because you are the employer and you're the one who's ultimately responsible um, you do need to set up these accounts and again provide that information to your payroll company with that one of the things to keep in mind is that as you uh, as you are hiring employees and you either know or expect that you're hiring an employee in a new state it's really important to start that payroll tax registration process soon and early. Um, while most of it is online and oftentimes you can get a confirmation instantly, we have run into issues ourselves and with some of our clients where some of those registration processes can take a few days, sometimes even a couple of weeks to get the information that you need for your payroll company to be able to properly process that payroll. So again, start early on that, do not uh, wait. Uh, talking a little bit about our timekeeping basics um, and some of what we're gonna talk about today is really gonna be a high level reminder for our government contractors out there. Um, there are a few uh, very specific things around payroll related items, such as timekeeping <clears throat> uh, that again are very important uh, for those government contractors to remember. Uh, one is that employees are responsible for entering their own time. 
uh, supervisors and or project managers need to review and approve that time. And there, just a, a practical thing to remember is that obviously a person's supervisor should be the one who's knowledgeable uh, of the fact that they have uh, that they are at work or that they're on leave um, or that they're, you know, if they're working off site, whatever the case may be. Uh, so their supervisor should know that they've worked 40 hours or 45 hours or whatever it is that they're reporting for this week. Uh, the nice thing about having project managers approve timesheets is that if you have um, billable time to clients and you've got employees who are working across multiple projects with multiple project managers, having those project managers review the timesheet for their projects, um, one, they can confirm that, yes, that employee did do that work on my project. Um, and that helps with uh, billing at the end of the month. Uh, so we don't get any surprises. It also helps the project managers be aware that that time was used against their project. And so, again, they have more visibility of that throughout the month instead of potentially being surprised at the end of the month to see a bunch of time that either maybe they were not expecting or maybe time got charged to the wrong project. Um, and so if the project managers are reviewing that throughout the month, uh, then we have less cleanup at the end of the month when it comes time to do the invoicing. <clears throat> and again, the other, uh, just a key distinction there and re uh, reminder is that employees need to fill out their timesheets. Supervisors and other people should not be completing an employee's timesheet. A um, couple of ex exceptions to that would be that if the employee is out on medical leave um, or something like that, where maybe they're unable to do it. Uh, we do have a couple of clients that sometimes uh, their employees are traveling to some remote locations to do work. And so they have connectivity issues um, and their ability to uh, enter timesheets. If you have one of those situations, uh, make sure that that's documented and that the employee goes back later uh, to enter that um, uh, to enter that time or approve that time, I should say. And then obviously another potential time that a supervisor or somebody else is entering um, uh, is entering the uh, time is at a final termination, right? So uh, you may have terminated an employee and somebody's got to enter their time for their last day of work. And then the other uh, last thing here, just really quickly about timekeeping basics, is that uh, accounting or payroll is going to import that time for labor distribution and uh, payroll. And I do see a question that has popped up that's relevant to this, so I want to um, talk about this real quickly. <clears throat> question is, throughout my career, I've been told that the government requires time to be recorded daily, yet I'm not able to have been uh, able to actually locate this requirement. Um, so this is actually not a FAR or a CAS requirement. Uh, the timekeeping requirements you will find in DCAA's information for contractors. Uh, we can make sure that we get that link out to you. Um, but if you go to DC, you can either Google um, DCAA information for contractor, and it should take you right there. Or if you go to DCAA's website and go into the uh, customer information, you can find that. So again, that's a separate document that's called the information for contractors. Great question, though, um, and it is one that comes up on a regular basis. All right, uh, let's talk briefly here about labor distribution and again, and how this uh, begins to tie into payroll. So labor distribution is uh, converting hours into dollars and then distributing those dollars across the general ledger and jobs. And so let me explain that just a little more. Um, we oftentimes encounter uh, clients who have excellent timekeeping. Uh, they can show us details by job, both internal and external. But then oftentimes what we find is that they only have a single labor expense or salary expense account in the general ledger. And so with that, we're unable to um, we're unable to properly calculate the indirect rates because we need those labor dollars broken out by direct labor, overhead labor, GNA labor. And then if you have any bids and proposals or IRAD labor, so we've got to have all of that broken out. Otherwise, we can't properly calculate rates. So that's one of the aspects of labor distribution, again, converting those hours into dollars. <clears throat> the other 
uh, in addition to making sure that we are posting them across the general ledger is that we're posting them to the jobs, right? So now I'm taking uh, uh, those dollars and I'm putting them against the job so that when I run a job cost report or job status report, whatever your system calls it, I now have the actual cost of the labor on that job, okay? Uh, one of the things related to this is uh, the ability to do uh, uncompensated overtime or total time accounting, right? So that's where for those exempt or salaried employees that we're calculating an effective hourly rate so that we are properly distributing their set salary across all hours worked. And obviously with uh, salaried or exempt employees, if they work uh more or less hours from week to week then that effective hourly rate again is going to go up or go down based upon the total hours worked and we have to be able to account for that in our labor distribution um the labor distribution process uh as a at a high level is basically debiting the expense accounts and notice that i said accounts plural there again we've got direct labor overhead labor etc and then it's crediting um, salaries payable. So at a high level, that's what's happening. This is not the actual processing of payroll yet. Again, this is just labor distribution. We've converted those hours into dollars, and then we've debited the expense account and credited salaries payable. That was a, a somewhat quick review of timekeeping and labor distribution. I do want to point you to our YouTube channel here. We've got a link um, uh, directly to it. When you uh, download the presentation, you can access the link. You can also go to youtube.com forward slash at Left Brain Pro or simply search for us Left Brain Pro on YouTube. We've got about 50 videos out there. This particular link takes you to a playlist of uh, four videos specifically, again, on timekeeping and labor distribution and payroll. With that, uh, I'll kick off our second poll question. Okay, what is labor distribution? We have four options. Uh, A, sharing the work among employees. B, converting hours into dollars. C, allocating fringe benefits. Or D, recording the payroll journal entry. We'll give everybody about another 10 or 15 seconds here again to answer this question. Just a reminder that you do have to answer three of the four polling questions in order to qualify for the CPE credits. It does look like almost everyone has participated. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and publish the results here. <clears throat> and so B, bravo is the correct answer right labor distribution that we just talked about is the conversion of hours into dollars all right now back to our content um and talk a little bit about the payroll journal entry and i also have an example to show you on the screen here in just a moment so the payroll journal entry and this is the one that's always um uh, this is one where we see clients get hung up. Um, they get really confused. I think that many people make the payroll journal entry more difficult than it needs to be. <clears throat> Sometimes we find, um, so, so I think that some of the reasons for that are uh, companies that try to have an integration uh, between their payroll provider and their general ledger. Uh, sometimes that works, but I will find that more often than not, we find that people struggle uh, to build and maintain an appropriate integration. Uh, and quite frankly, for most clients, there's really no need to have a uh, general ledger integration because the journal entry itself, again, is pretty simple and straightforward. <clears throat> and then the other nice thing with most accounting software today is that you can build journal entry templates. And so you know that, you know, I'm always going to be using these accounts. Obviously, the dollar amounts will vary um, from pay period to pay period, especially with hourly employees. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, but we can build that template. So we've got a list of our accounts. Um, we often uh, as well work with clients to build a template in Excel so that they can take information from the payroll summary report or your cash report. Uh, each payroll provider has different titles for some of these reports, but uh, they all provide you some type of report that reconciles the amount that they're taking out for out of your bank in terms of cash, and then what the employer taxes are, what your salary is payable should be, that kind of stuff. And so then it's pretty easy to take that, uh, the numbers from that report, plug them into the Excel template. You can confirm that your journal entry balances. Uh, some, again, software will allow you to either import uh, that Excel template. Uh, you can, uh, again, in most software, you can just build a, a template in the tool so that you open that template and go type in the numbers, um, which again, for many companies, even some relatively large companies, uh, you know, a journal entry of eight to 12 lines is fairly common. And if you've got the template there and you simply need to type in the numbers, it's really not that difficult. And again, uh, that's why I tell people I don't really get concerned about whether you have um, a hard integration with your payroll. Now, that said, if you come to me and say, Robert, I've got 1,000 employees or 5,000 employees and I've got a bunch of hourly people and we've got all these different contributions and all this stuff going on, uh, you know, then absolutely having a, a direct payroll integration in that situation can be helpful. We certainly, but, it, but again, it's not required. <clears throat> and most of our clients are, uh, you know, somewhere in that 20 to 50 employee range. And uh, so manually keying in some stuff is usually not that difficult. The other thing to keep in mind is that we can also uh, usually in both directions use some CSV files to get the information. So for example, I can do my timekeeping and labor distribution in my general ledger tool. I can export a payroll report in CSV format. I can then log into my payroll provider, upload that CSV file. And so I get the information for hourly employees, for example, in there simply and easily without having to do um, any manual data entry. Back to our basic payroll journal entry here though. Uh, again, if we just take a step back um, and remember that when we ran labor distribution, we were we debited again our expense accounts. We credited uh, salaries payable. So now, when I've gone to payroll and I've actually processed payroll and I need to do a journal entry, then one of the first things I'm going to do is debit salaries payable, right? If my labor distribution credited salaries payable, and if everything worked correctly in my uh, payroll then I should be debiting salaries payable for the same amount. And now I have a net zero after processing payroll. The next big thing is I obviously have to credit cash because uh, again, the, the payroll company has taken the cash from my account to be able to do uh, the direct deposit and to pay the employer taxes. Uh, when we ran labor distribution, we're not doing taxes, right? That's the responsibility of the payroll side. So now in my payroll journal entry, I need to debit my employer taxes. <clears throat> and here we're talking about uh, debiting the employer tax expense. I'll talk about liabilities in just a moment. Uh, and then depending on your company and what's going on, you may have some other entries for things like retirement, employee contributions to health insurance and garnishment. Uh, those are the most common ones. Uh, some of these things are going to vary a little bit depending on whether your payroll provider, um, uh, some people are getting benefits through the payroll provider. So there are other transactions for that. Uh, sometimes you're simply collecting the employee contributions to health insurance and you're paying the health, you're paying the benefits bill separately, but you obviously need to get that money back from employees. Similar concept for retirement uh, some employers and some of our clients. Uh, they're making those retirement contributions on their own, separate from payroll. Some of them are processing that through payroll, right? So again, we may still be collecting employees' contributions, but we're making the, the payments ourselves. Um, again, garnishments coming out. So you can see where that bullet point there, you, you may have some other debits and credits in your payroll journal entry. <clears throat> 
again, once you set up the template, that typically doesn't change very much. And so uh, set up your template and then you've got the basic information. Um, a couple of other things I'm gonna point out here when it comes to payroll and payroll journal entries. Uh, typically what we see is that most payroll providers do two cash transactions. Uh, so they'll do a cash transaction to take the money out to do the direct deposits, and then they'll do a separate uh, cash transaction to do all of the taxes. So they'll take uh, all of the tax deposits. So that's both um, the employer and the employee portions of the tax that was correct collected. And they will do one big uh, cash transaction from you and then do all of the deposits to the appropriate agencies. Um, you can uh, combine all of this into a single journal entry, and we find that to be very helpful, um, that you take both reports for the payroll and for the taxes to a single journal entry. Um, you can still do them as separate, separate journal entries. There's really no right or wrong answer um, to that approach. Um, <clears throat> And then my last bullet there is gonna vary a little bit depending on whether you want to do separate journal entries. Um, but keep in mind that in the, today's world, um, practically speaking, most companies do not have tax liabilities that need to be recorded on the balance sheet because we're paying those taxes at the same time that we're paying uh, payroll. Uh, now, if you're going to do those separate journal entries, then the only way that that's going to work is you're going to have to record a temporary tax liability uh, between those two transactions, between the direct deposit transaction, between the tax transaction, in order for all of that to work out. Uh, but your payroll tax liabilities accounts should net to zero immediately as soon as you process both of those transactions, right? So from the direct deposit transaction obviously we're going to have to record um we're going to have to record the employees portion of taxes that were withheld and then the other transaction the separate uh, tax cash transaction from your bank is going to have the employer taxes and so that's going to be the debits in there and then your credits are going to be to cash um your other debit is going to be to your payroll taxes that were withheld uh might be a little confusing what i just said hopefully that um, makes sense <clears throat> but again the goal here is at the end of processing payroll you should be able to look at the balance sheet and your salaries payable should be zero uh, and your payroll tax liabilities should be zero immediately after processing payroll um, if it's not, right, then we've got problems. And uh, so the problems could be that we had something wrong with labor distribution. Uh, when we did that and we credited our salaries payable, we could have had a problem with payroll processing. Maybe we didn't get the right hours in or something that caused uh, a problem there. Uh, some other problems that will, that will pop up are if we updated somebody's pay rate in uh, payroll, but we forgot to update that pay rate in uh, our timekeeping and labor distribution, and that will cause some variances in our salaries payable. And then similarly, we could have um, some problems with taxes if we don't pay attention to those journal entries. But again, if we do it correctly, and it should be one of your checks, is at the end of every payroll, make sure those balance sheet counts are zero. All right. Um, here's an example. Um, of what a journal entry looks like. This is a little more simplified, but again, for many of our clients, it's really not much more difficult than this. Again, this is the payroll journal entry. So I've already done my labor distribution. Again, tax is gonna come out and I just made up some numbers here. So these aren't representative of any percentages um, that we might normally see. But, you know, cash came out to do the direct deposit, cash came out to do the tax deposit. Uh, what are my offsets? Well, obviously I've got salaries payable and my salaries payable is gonna be higher, right? Than my direct deposit amount because there's gonna be the employee's portion of taxes and other deductions that come out. Um, we can see that I've got a line here for my employer taxes. Uh, that would be a debit to the expense. <clears throat> I have some additional credits down here 
Uh, again, employee health contribution, right? That's going to be a credit, one that's going to be what makes this journal entry balance. But also keep in mind that if health insurance expense is a debit, then the employee's contribution back to that is a credit. Um, now, you can, and we generally recommend that employers uh, simply post that to the same account. And so you can have one account where you're debiting the monthly uh, health care bill, and then you're crediting back the employee contributions each month. You could certainly set up a separate GL account that is your contra account. And so you have, uh, for example, you might have an account that's 6001 is health insurance and 6002 is my contra account that's always going to be negative that can be helpful if you want to keep those separate and make it a little easier to reconcile uh, but then again they net out together in my fringe pool to the proper amount um, similar concept here for uh, employee retirement contribution but this is going to be again to the balance sheet this is going to be a liability right because we have uh taken this money from the employees and now we need to deposit that on their behalf uh, and so then when we do when we write that check right that's going to be a credit to cash and a debit to that liability account and then similar concept for garnishments right so if we typically though the payroll company is paying the garnishments for our employees um, it's possible you might be paying those but usually if you get notification for garnishment you forward that to the payroll company and they take care of deducting it from the employee's salary and um, paying it to the appropriate agency uh, or person as necessary. <clears throat> I wanna talk a little bit about payroll providers and some of our partners. Uh, certainly at the beginning um, of our webinar, I mentioned things like ADP, paychecks, uh paylocity there are a number of companies out there and we continue to see um, some growth in some of these these are simply the ones that we've partnered with uh, and i'll share just a little bit about them gusto is really up and coming they've got a great support team works really well with the small businesses um, one of the nice things about gusto is that you can also get benefits very affordable through them does integrate um, with QuickBooks. Uh, we don't provide, personally as a firm, we don't provide any long-term QuickBooks support, uh, which is a different conversation. And there's a blog post and other information on our website about that. Um, but it's a great tool. It's very, very affordable. That's one of the other nice things um, that when you're looking for a payroll provider, uh, very, very affordable. Paylocity is a great uh, provider. They're one of the larger ones that's out there. Um, the only thing that I would tell you about Paylocity is that they don't offer any benefits themselves. So if you're a small business and maybe you're either you're just getting set up, maybe you're looking for a way to integrate um, your benefits more, maybe you're not happy with the benefits that you have, and so you're looking for another provider. Gusto, again, um, does provide uh, that opportunity that you can get benefits through them. Paylocity does not. Now, again, you can still set up and they integrate with some of the benefit providers out there. They just don't sell any of the benefits through their platform. And then in Sparity, some of you may know uh, what's nice about them is that uh, if you're doing any uh, prevailing wage or SCA contracts, if you need to do certified payroll, they really understand government contractors. Um, they also provide uh benefits so, so you can buy your benefits through them as well um and they are they also have a peo or a leased employee approach which makes sense for some employers um again different options out here uh, we don't uh, uh, think that there is any one solution that always satisfies uh, a client and so that's why we give you multiple options to look at if you're interested in any of these we've got additional information on our website um, you can also contact us and we'd be happy to get you in touch or to get you set up on one of these uh, payroll options <clears throat> i want to talk a little bit about intuit and quickbooks and this is uh, uh, not meant to badger them in any way but simply to highlight some of the issues that we encounter um, in working with intuit and quickbooks um, in particular with the payroll uh, and we're seeing this right now with a 
few different clients that have come to us uh, who are already using Intuit. Um, and those of you who are using Intuit Payroll have probably encountered some of the very uh, same issues. Uh, one of the things is that uh, uh, QuickBooks Online does not support labor distribution at all with or without um, the integrated payroll. Uh, the only way to do labor distribution in QuickBooks Online is to do it in Excel, and then you have to uh, manually enter that journal entry in order for that to work. Um, you can do a labor distribution with QuickBooks Desktop. It does require a very specific configuration. We've given you a link here uh, to some information provided by uh, one of our uh, partners at iCAT Systems. ICAD is a, a tool that works with QuickBooks Desktop to give you uh, the indirect rates and labor distribution and other things that are required for government contractors. It's a great tool. If you're using QuickBooks Desktop, we highly recommend uh, that you check out the ICAT tool and work with them. It's a great tool and it's a great group of people out there and we're happy to make an introduction. Um, but again, uh, it's a nice link here that walks you through how to set up uh, your QuickBooks desktop configuration so that you can actually do labor distribution in there. And in short, what I'll tell you is that it does require running a uh, mock or uh, a manual uh, payroll in QuickBooks desktop in order to be able to do that. It does work well, um, but again, it does require that very specific setup. A um, couple of the other reasons, though, uh, uh, why we do not recommend Intuit QuickBooks, particularly to have an integrated payroll, which is what you're typically getting uh, if you're using QuickBooks and you use the Intuit payroll. Um, one, they have an automated journal entry that you cannot correct or adjust. And so once it gets posted by their system, if you find that there is a problem, uh, you cannot go in and update it. You can't change it. Uh, you, you're limited to a couple of options. One is to call their support and try to get them to make any changes or adjustments. The other is that you're doing journal entries to undo. You have to do a separate journal entry to undo their posting and read and correct it the way you want it. Um, we've also found and we've heard that commuting with Intuit support is time consuming and difficult. Um, we've got a number of clients who are frustrated with Intuit and are moving away from their integrated solution because of some of these things. Um, so I just point this out to you um, that if you're considering an integrated payroll, um, and again, some people think, uh, and I would also tell you this with even some of the other providers out there is what I was saying earlier. Uh, if you think that you want or need an integrated payroll, I would caution you against it. Uh, because oftentimes these tools are doing journal entries and things as part of the integration that makes it difficult to do corrections. So just keep that in mind. All right, we've got another polling question here. So let me kick that off. So our third poll question, all payroll providers know how to properly calculate labor distribution and uncompensated overtime. Yes or no? All right, so we'll give you just another few seconds here to answer this uh, polling question. Uh, don't forget to take advantage of that Q&A panel if you've got questions that have come up uh, with what we've talked about today. Uh, again, timekeeping, labor distribution, payroll journal entries. Uh, if you've got questions about payroll providers, any of that, um, do not hesitate to ask. And I'm going to go ahead and publish the result here. And so what's interesting is that... Uh, uh, most everybody got this correct, even though I didn't um, spend as much time uh, talking about this. So, so I will share just a little bit of information about that now. Um, when it comes to labor distribution and uncompensated overtime, or again, for government contractors that unallowable, I'm sorry, not uh, got my tongue tied, for co government contractors who are doing total time accounting, and uh, calculating uncompensated overtime, <clears throat> I have yet to find 
a payroll provider and we work with all of them uh, at some point or another, I've yet to find a payroll provider that actually understands and can properly calculate uncompensated overtime. And again, really quickly, that uncompensated overtime is uh, I have an employee whose salary, right, exempt, they have a fixed salary, is built on an assumed 40 hours per week. But if they work more or less, right, then we have to calculate what that effective hourly rate is per week or per pay period. Because I can't say, well, I, you know, it was built assuming they're making, you know, $50 an hour. Well, if they work more hours, their per rate, their, per, their hourly rate drops, right? Because they still only get 2,000 hours a week or $2,000 a week, right? Um, so we have to uh, make that adjustment. And what we have found is that uh, these payroll providers in their labor distribution and job cost reports and things that they promise that they can do for you, um, what we have found is that their system only understands a salary person makes, yes, it's $2,000 a week, <clears throat> but their system only understands $50 per hour. Uh, their systems don't have the ability to calculate that effective rate and actually deliver you an appropriate report. Um, the other thing that I want to say um, uh, about uh, payroll here is related to this and labor distribution is that we have yet to find any payroll providers that can offer a true integration with job costing and be able to track your jobs and be able to do that job cost or labor distribution report from that level as well. Um, they simply don't provide that. You know, if you're a really small company and maybe all you do is painting and you don't need to capture all of those costs by job, again, some of those uh, more strict requirements that government contractors have, then taking advantage of some of those reports in your payroll provider might work. But again, for government contractors, we find that they simply don't have the ability to generate the appropriate reports that are necessary for compliance. <clears throat> and that's not a knock against any particular Payroll provider, again, we have found that to be true across the board um, with ones that we work with. All right, let's talk a little more about payroll providers and payroll services that are out there. Uh, some of you may know this, but we always just like to highlight as well. So obviously when we're talking about payroll and payroll providers, right, they're gonna process payroll, you're gonna get direct deposit. Um, they're gonna do what we call full service payroll, meaning that uh, they're gonna file the taxes on your behalf. They're gonna make those tax payments on your behalf. Um, yeah, the nice thing about that <clears throat> for the people that I saw in the beginning is that they were processing their own, own payroll. Um, they take the liability for that as well, so that if they mess up, then they will pay any fees or penalties, fines, et cetera. Um, related to their errors, uh, which again is nice, but they take the burden and administration off, right? It's automated. They're already processing payroll. They've already got all of that information. Why not let them go ahead and pay the, do the tax payments and do the, um, and do the uh, payroll filing as well. Um, it, it's just so much easier and it's so affordable. Uh, most of these solutions out there, you're paying, you know, uh, probably all in on, and it's gonna, it's gonna vary by some of the platforms of what you do, but all in you're probably paying anywhere from six to $12 per employee per month. Um, and so it's really an affordable fee when you think about um, all the work that they do. Now, in addition to basic payroll and direct deposit and taxes, uh, most of these providers also do things like benefits and benefits administration. Uh, again, as I said earlier, Paylocity does not sell benefits themselves. Gusto and Insperity do, uh, but all of them do offer benefits administration, and so they can integrate with many of the providers that you already have. <clears throat> uh, they also do new hire tracking, right? So if you have to uh, meet all of those compliance requirements, or if you just simply want to be able to track, hey, we've got five open jobs and we've got... <clears throat> excuse me, we've got, you know, 10 applicants per job and we're trying to track where they are in the process and did we interview them and did they submit the paperwork? Um, they, they offer all these kinds of tools. They also offer onboarding tools. 
Uh, so you can have um, employees fill out their own documentation up front. It's all online. Uh, we don't have to do paper. We don't have to get copies of stuff because they're either going to upload copies or they're going to take a picture of their ID as an example as part of the I-9. They can do all of that kind of stuff um, electronically now. Uh, and again, you get the compliance around that onboarding, which again is very important, especially around I-9 and some of those other uh, requirements. Uh, you can do your training uh, and uh, LMS or learning management system. Uh, most of these providers have a lot of canned training available to you that you can simply go in and assign that training to employees. You can also upload your own training. Um, and then the LMS feature or that learning management system, what's nice is that it tracks all of that. And so you can put in, you know, employees, again, for government contractors, we're supposed to be doing annual timesheet training. So you can upload that in there. You can set it to be, um, you know, uh, at new hire, and you can either set it, you know, it's one, it's one year from their new hire, or it's new hire, and then everybody does it at a set time each year. Um, again, and maybe you have other specific training requirements. You can schedule all of that, and then the system takes care of it. It tracks it. You know that it's done. It sends automated emails. You can download reports, all of that kind of stuff. Um, ACA compliance, EEO compliance, other types of compliance are available through these uh, uh, platforms. HR consulting. <clears throat> so if you're having um, HR issues, if you've got questions, if you've got an employee that's problematic um, and, and maybe you are considering terminating them or you're considering, you know, how do I deal with this? You know, I've got an employee who's always showing up late or I've got an employee who's, you know, causing problems with other employees, whatever it might be. Um, they can help you through that process, right? So you've got HR consultants um, on hand to do that. They can help you with employee handbooks, those labor law posters. Um, and then they all offer, and you'll see that I've got a couple of asterisks out here. And there's some other tools as well, but these are kind of most of them. Uh, most all of these tools uh, providers offer timekeeping and a GL integration. So I've already said, don't be caught up in the GL integration unless you've got thousands of uh, hourly employees and you know and a lot to deal with there. Um, the timekeeping, uh, is similar to some of the other stuff, I have yet to find any of these providers that have a timekeeping solution that meets the requirements that are necessary for government contractors. And again, those are the requirements that are in that information for contractors that you can find on DCAA's website. Um, they do have timekeeping tools, <clears throat> but again, um, the job keeping them synchronized with your jobs that are set up in your general ledger can be difficult. Um, and they simply just don't have the requirements. And so it's things like preventing people from entering time in the future, uh, more importantly, it's uh, requiring notes and sending daily email notifications and, again, other things that are specific requirements. And then the expense reimbursement, um, they all do offer expense uh, reporting tools and expense reimbursement. From the expense reporting perspective, it's really similar to the timekeeping and the GL integration. Proper, if you're doing expense reports through these providers, getting that information back to your general ledger can be difficult. And then even if you're doing expense reports in your system, in your general ledger, um, doing the expense reimbursement through payroll, we have found to be um, confusing at best. Um, it can be very confusing to employees to see big fluctuations in their payroll. Um, more importantly, what we find is that it, uh, it makes the payroll journal entry more difficult. And we have found many, many clients who have uh, errors in the journal entry that have caused a lot of problems, right? So if you're gonna do expense reimbursement through payroll, uh, just remember that it is gonna make the journal entry more complicated and you need to make sure that you're posting those expense reimbursements correctly in the general ledger and that they're not labor. That is in fact, one of the problems that we found is that people end up uh, posting those as labor. It's not labor. And then you can see how that causes problems later on with either various reconciliations or trying to calculate indirect rates. <clears throat> Some other um, common issues uh, that we run into with payroll. Um, 
and this is the first one is a big one. We see this all the time. People will make adjustments at payroll without flowing them through timekeeping, labor distribution, and the general ledger. Uh, a common one that happens and what we'll see is people do timesheets, they do the labor distribution, they go to process payroll and somebody goes, oh, we forgot to update Bob's salary. And so they go in and they update Bob's salary and payroll so that the payroll is correct and Bob gets the appropriate amount of money that he's expecting, but they forget to go back and flow that through timekeeping, labor distribution and general ledger. And so now a couple of things uh, are going to be wrong. My, labor distribution, my expense um, is going to be wrong, and my salary is payable is going to be wrong. And so now when I do a journal entry to offset, well, what's going to happen? I'm going to have this weird balance, you know, variance in my salaries payable account, and then I'm going to be digging through trying to find out what happened. We also see this with things like bonus or PTO, PTO payout, um, especially if an employee is terminated or if you have a PTO buyback. What we'll find is that people, again, will make those changes to payroll. They forget to flow them through the other side. And then we've got these variances that we can't figure out. Um, people trying to track PTO in timekeeping and payroll. And I'll just say trying to keep those two systems in sync is uh, a nightmare. Uh, and in fact, we rarely find anybody who does keep it in sync. And, and anybody who is doing it is usually complaining about the process. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, again, sometimes what we find is that at the time of payroll, somebody goes, oh, wait a minute, you know, Bob entered his timesheet wrong. He was actually on PTO last week and it got, you know, loaded as his regular job or something. And, but they fix it in payroll. They forget to go back and fix it on the other side. Um, people make adjustments, right? So some things can happen. And so now all of a sudden adjustment is made in one place, but not the other. Um, so we recommend that you do timekeeping, including uh, PTO in your general ledger. Most of those systems are all integrated now. And then maintain the balances there. Don't try to synchronize those hourly balances with payroll. <clears throat> Uh, another common problem is people expensing PTO when it's used instead of when it's earned. So a couple of problems with that. One, it doesn't meet gap and uh, you're not properly matching the expense because the expense uh, occurs when it's earned, right? So if, if employees are earning PTO either at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of each month with each payroll, you know, if it's by hour, whatever your whatever your policy is, Whenever that's earned is when it's supposed to be expensed. Um, it also then becomes a liability on the balance sheet. And you should see a more steady PTO expense throughout the year. And then when it's used, we deduct it from the liability. Um, if you are expensing it when it's used, then one, we're not reporting the liability. So now my financial statements aren't correct. But then you're also gonna see big swings in your PTO expense, like around holidays and the summer, Right, and so it makes the financial statements look a little wonky. Uh, the last, and there's probably some others, but the last common issue that I've got identified here is we see, and see this especially with small companies who are just getting started, they don't really understand payroll and accounting, they don't understand those confusing payroll reports, and they end up doing journal entries that record net pay based upon the cash that was uh, taken out instead of recording gross labor and employer taxes and doing stuff correctly. And again, then what we find is that uh, indirect rates are incorrect because of this. Um, and the then obviously your payroll reports don't really tie to the general ledger because you've recorded the wrong amount. Um, with that, a couple of best practices here. Uh, we've got a couple of slides left and one more polling question. A couple of be best practices here. One is to reconcile your payroll reports to the labor distribution with every single payroll and look for things like I said earlier, your lab, your salaries payable account should be to zero. Um, if you are running things through payroll liability as separate journal entries, then again, with every payroll, because we're making those deposits automatically through payroll company, uh, with every payroll, salaries payable should be zero and those liability counts should be zero. And if they're not, we should immediately look into that and find out what's going on. <clears throat> the next one is to reconcile your quarterly payroll reports to labor distribution in your tax forms. This one is a little more difficult um, because we have things like pre-tax, post-tax, 
post-tax deductions, we have garnishments, we have things that get added back to earnings, such as group term life um, or escort owner, uh, health insurance type of stuff that are not labor related items, but are earnings and tax issues that flow through. Uh, but it's really, really important uh, to do this quarterly reconciliation. Uh, again, especially for government contractors, especially if you are doing cost type contracts and have to do that incurred cost proposal, because we have to do this reconciliation for schedule L in the incurred cost proposal. And if you do this reconciliation quarterly, then when you do the last one at the end of the year, it's done, the year is done. And then when we go to do Schedule L, Schedule L is so much cleaner, so much easier because you've done these reconciliations. Um, unfortunately, what happens is we end up you know, trying, trying to do the incurred cost proposal in May or June, and now several months have passed and we find problems and now digging back through all of that and trying to reconcile it is just very confusing and difficult. So I really can't stress enough, reconcile payroll to your reports with every pay period and identify any issues and get them resolved. And then again, reconcile those quarterly payroll reports to your labor distribution and tax forms so that we don't have any surprises at the end of the year. <clears throat> all right, our last polling question, uh, we've also got a couple of Q&A that popped in. Let me start this poll and there that goes. Okay. Our Final poll question. How much help do you need with your payroll? Um, A, B, and C, none. We've got this. We like, we like our provider, but need help with reports and journal entries, or you may want a totally new provider. And while you guys are answering that, um, I'm gonna advance the slide, which will come up here in just a moment. And again, I know we've got a couple of Q&A questions. We still have a few minutes left in our webinar, so hopefully you'll stick around so we can uh, do those uh, Q&A. <clears throat> Give you about five seconds to finish that polling question. It looks like almost everybody has voted in that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll and show you the results. And there's no right or wrong answer here. Just happy that you're with us and uh, participated. Uh, before we get to the q a i do want to highlight uh, that my book is now available and you of you may be aware of that i've got a book out there government contract accounting made easy it is available on amazon uh, you can get that in kindle and paperback if you're interested in additional training uh, on government contract accounting and something with that book we'd love to help you with that so get in touch let me flip over here to the uh, q a and all right so i see some questions have you ever heard of a prime requesting a sub to report straight eight hours every day for ffp sub subcontract and is that allowed well the technical answer is uh i yes i have heard it um but the you know it's not right your employees need to record all time work whether direct or indirect whether paid or unpaid um, employees need to record all time work period that's the right answer um under total time keeping it is very unlikely holidays and pto time are exceptions an ffp award oh so, sorry steven answered that um if there's unlimited pto do you just record it when used yes you can do that um certainly as you're getting started um the other thing that i would tell you is that you could certainly build a um uh, even though you're not, you won't necessarily have a liability unless you have that written in the policy, but most people that have an unlimited PTO, you don't have any payout when somebody terminates, right? Because there's no pool to pay from. But what you could do and really what the best practice would be is to have an estimate, right? You can assume that most people are going to do two, three, four weeks a year, whatever it is that's in your industry. You could build on um, that, you could then expense it, and then you would just have to do some reconciliations. Uh, I would certainly do at least an annual reconciliation, though certainly um, monthly or quarterly reconciliations would be really helpful, just so that again, we're not seeing big spikes in the, uh, you know, in, in our financial statements. All right, uh, that's our one hour together. I really do thank you uh, for participating. We appreciate that. Um, couple of more slides here let me get over 
Um, if you do need to contact us after today, you can find more information on our website at leftbrainpro.com. Uh, you can email us support at leftbrainpro. We're on social media. Really encourage you to check out the YouTube channel because, again, we've got about 50 videos out there. Um, you'll be able to download this information, including the video, a little bit later. It takes us a few hours to get that posted. And uh, if you participated in this webinar, uh, you will be added if you're not already on our mailing list. Uh, we do a monthly uh, newsletter that goes out, and we'll also get a couple of emails about each webinar that's coming up. Thanks for participating, and we will chat with you soon. Have a great day. Thanks for joining.